songs. We're going to sing that song, Alive, Alive. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah, oh hallelujah. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah, oh hallelujah. My Jesus is alive, alive. Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. One more time. Alive, alive. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah. Amen. If we could all stand tonight, we're going to sing that song, There is Power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. One more time. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. All right, we're going to slow it down tonight and sing that song, Awesome is the Sight. Awesome is the sight of your Majestic is your purity, your righteousness shines brighter than the sun.
Thank you, Jesus, huh? Aren't we so glad that, that somebody was willing to do something like that for us? Amen? We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. Um, I want to lift up a few things here tonight. Um, first of all, um, those who are sick in body and need God to help them. Uh, Tad for healing. My wife, Vicki, for recovery from her knee surgery. She goes tomorrow to the doctor, thank God, finally. You see what's going on there. Anyway, Elizabeth is still not feeling well. This is Esther's sister. And Doug's wife, Karen, is, um, the ice is mean. It took a chunk out of her leg, and she's recovering from that. But, you know, God can move in those situations. And uh, maybe you're here tonight. Maybe there's a need that you have that's specific to you, that you can just significant. Raise your hand and say, yeah, I have a need. And, and you know what? Cry out that need. You know, God says you have not because you ask not. So we're going to ask and believe God for a miracle. And then we're going to ask God for, we have the Bible conference. To, this is international night. And powerful things are happening when we talk about that. Well, it's international night. No, there's specific men going to specific places to reach specific people that God is orchestrating through all these men. We need God to help them just make that thing work. And then also for those that are there, that they would be touched. Um, it's an awesome. If you could go to conference, ever can go to conference, do it. You'll really be glad you did. So anyway, we're going to lift up the conference and then this service. And anyway, after we uh, subside, I'd like to ask uh, Rory, would you open us up in, uh, in the service? Let's pray. Father God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, God, we lift up those that are sick in body, Lord God, those that are hurting, God, those that need healing. Uh, God, in their hand, we pray for the overseas uh, night tonight, God, your hand and your, your destiny, Lord God, for those men. Uh, we pray, God, tonight for your hand to move in this service. Let our hearts be open. Sunday, God. Amen. You can have your seats if you could, would. And we're going to continue um, a few announcements to make. We have, uh, of course, we have people in conference in Prescott, and they'll be heading home um, Saturday. So we just pray for them in your time that you just help them to get back safely. Um, Sunday school, facing rejection is a subject. And how many could need help with, how many ever been rejected in life? This is an awesome study. This, this is right where we are. Because those rejections, they, they come and they come at you uh, when you least expect it. You know, so, and somebody says, well, I don't ever worry about that. Well, I'm glad that if you don't. But a lot of people do. And so this is a great thing. You should be there 615 as uh, prayer. Seven for the study on Sunday, and then of course Sunday morning our, our pastor will be back, and I'm sure that there's going to be some testimonies, and and he's going to be ready to to tear it up for the for Jesus, Amen. So um, that's happening. We're going to go ahead and take uh, an offering tonight. Uh, it's a good opportunity for you to give back what God has given you. It's a good opportunity for you to say, "I'm going to prove you, Lord, that." If I put in a little bit, you're going to bless me later on down the life because God, he challenges us. And when you get a challenge from God, I don't think God's going to uh, pull back on his promise. If he says, if you, prove, tr if you trust me, I'll prove you. So pay your tithes, your offerings. Uh, We've got to finish paying for the TVs. There's a couple other things that they want to do. But remember, it all takes uh, a little dinero here and there and and God uses his people to get these things done. So anyway, we're going to do that. So um, let's go ahead. We're going to uh, take an offering. And uh, I'd like to get um, oh, Raiden, if you'd ask a blessing on the, on the offering.
God, Father God, we come before you tonight, God. We pray, God, that you just have an abundance upon the offering tonight, God. Speak to people, God, amounts, God, to be able to pay for these things, God. And we praise you and know that you're going to bring it back tenfold. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's sing this song, Alive, Alive. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah, oh hallelujah. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah, oh hallelujah. My Jesus is alive. Right, thank you. The musicians, Braden, did a great job. Yeah. Am I alive? Can you hear me? All right, let me get my stuff together here a little bit. God is great, isn't he? Amen. We serve an awesome God. Yes. And, you know, God is... Uh, God is a God that is solid, amen, like a rock. Amen. Something you can depend on, something you can hold on to, and with confidence to know that, that whatever God says is true, and God is not a liar, and God is faithful. And so we're going to be, uh, a sermon tonight is going to be called, Grab a Hold of the Horns of the Altar. Yeah. Amen. It's out of Exodus chapter 27 verse 2 and you know he said grab a hold of the altar well consider ever heard of grabbing a hold of the horns of a bull <laughs> just consider that here's this nasty bull and he's he's paw on the ground and, and you just grab his horns and he he's trying to move his head but you got him just about right and to hold that bull's head, if you've ever been on a farm, you better hold on to it. And you better be solid to the ground because if they're pretty strong and they can just throw you to the side in a heartbeat. But if you're determined and you get him before he realizes that you have a lot of power and control over that bull. Okay, and that's the way life is. Sometimes grabbing a hold of life, it can be like a big bull. Um, not so good. We... Uh, I lived in Arlington in the last couple of years of my high school years, and there was a Jersey dairy farm down there, and they had a, uh, a bull named Brutus. And Brutus was a little young, but Brutus was always in the field on the other side, so we used to try to cut across the corner of the, the, the uh, yard there, and he'd lift his head up, he'd see us, snort, and come a-running. And you know what you had to do? Run. run. Yeah. And run fast. Run. And hope you get through the barbed wire fence before he gets you in the hind end. But he used to think it's a game to him. He'd wait. He'd wait because he knew we were coming. And so uh, this is like sometimes life. Life is like cutting across the field a big bull in the thing. And you've got to survive that, uh, that run across that way. Um, out of Exodus chapter 27, verse 2, it says, And thou shalt make the horns of, of it upon the four corners thereof, and his horn shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. And I kind of like that. You make these wooden horns, and then you put brass on them. And the reason you put brass on them is because that makes them pretty darn tough. Right? And so... You know, as you navigate through life, there are times, there are things, there are circumstances um, that seems like going through an earthquake. How many ever been through an earthquake? I remember we were up, my wife and I we were married uh, and living in Mountain Home, Idaho. Anybody know where Mountain Home, Idaho is? That's about 35 miles east of Boise. It's the most boring 35 miles you'll ever drive in your whole life. There's nothing there, and it just goes on and on and on. And if you're lucky, you'll see a coyote running across the desert or a couple jackrabbits, but boring. Well, anyway, uh, that's where my first uh, station of base was. It was the place that said, um, 
I asked the guy, my, the guy that was going to be kind of helping me get settled in there. I was a young, you know, young man, not married. And so I was all into finding girlfriends. I said, well, how many girls are up there in that base up there? He says, hey, there's one behind every tree. And he was so positive. And I go, oh, that's awesome. And then I got there. There's no trees. But in that, I found my wife, Vicki. Because there was one there that God wanted me to have, right? So, so we're in a, our house. I just, we just bought in this little three-bedroom um, rambler, and we're laying there in our water bed. How many heard of a water bed? See, you young folks don't know what a water bed is, do you? We literally slept on a big bag of water. And we're laying in the bed, and all of a sudden, the bed started to shake. And ripple. And we're laying there going, what's, what's going on? And all of a sudden, now we're laying in this water bed, and it's two to three foot swells and choppy water. It's just all over the place, and the lamps are swinging. The pictures are falling off the walls. And it is chaos. And it came out of nowhere. I mean, we're, imagine you're sleeping, right? Peaceful. And all of a sudden, you hear it shake, and pretty soon, you're going like this, and pretty soon, the bed's going like that. Well, that's the way life can be at times. Things can be going just perfect, right? You can be having a wonderful time. You, you know, you get on the driving on the road, and you're listening to your music, and you're rocking out. And all of a sudden, the sirens come on. And the reason the sirens are coming on is because you didn't realize that you were going over the speed limit because you were really getting into your music and you completely forgot that you went through a school zone that was, you're going 40 and it's supposed to be 20 and you missed the flashing lights. You missed the little camera going boom like that. And here's a sheriff at the end and he pulls you over and he says, do you know why I pulled you over? Um, no. Or maybe you do know why, but you don't want to really admit it, right? I was going across the trestle, and I was going 75 miles an hour across the trestle in a van. <laughs> I, wasn't, I was thinking about my next job in Snohomish, and I just started going. And pretty soon I looked up, and behind me was the uh, state patrol, and in front of me was one uh, pulled over across the street, and he turned his lights on, so I just pull over. You know why I pulled you over? Um, I was speeding. You know how fast you were going? Um, 70? No, you were going 75, sir. Because sometimes we get going in life, and we don't realize things are starting to happen, and they catch us uh, unaware. Un we, you know, but because sometimes we're not paying attention sometimes. Sometimes we just don't realize it. And... Ever notice that things, when they do happen, it's at the most inconvenient time? When's the one time you're going to get a flat tire? When it's raining. Always seems to be raining, pouring down rain. And then you open up the trunk, because you know you got a spare in there, but you haven't looked at it for how long? And you get it out, and you go, it's flat. Right? So I'm on, I'm on the trestle coming across to work. I get a flat tire, and I pull off where that little, there's a uh, trailer that's got some kind of advertising there. And I pull off, and this guy from Wadot comes, and he's going to help me. So we got to go all the way back to my house and get a tire. Well, it was flat at the house, and we had to go all the way. He took me all the way to... Les Schwab, they fixed it. He brought me all the way in my car and fixed it. But it was crazy, right? I mean, here you are. I'm, I need to get to work. But things are happening, and it's not going well. Got to call my boss and say, hey, I'll be there as soon as I can. My tire's flat. And so luckily my boss is gracious because he's had flat tires himself. And, but how I dealt with that situation could or could not have been good or it could have been awfully bad. Now, if the guy hadn't showed up, I might have been bad because I probably would have been beside myself throwing a fit, right? 
and maybe saying things I probably shouldn't say, but because somebody was watching me, I had to behave myself. But what happens when no one's watching you? Or what happens when it's a loved one and you think you can get away with bad behavior? Ever get in a fight with your spouse? Ever say things that you thought later? <laughs> probably shouldn't have said that. Or you say something and you don't even realize you said it, and then pretty soon you go to talk to your spouse and they're really quiet. They're not saying a word. And you go, uh-oh. And you ask a stupid question. Did I do something wrong? And the question answer back, you don't know what you did? Um, you, you're trying to think, no. <laughs> well, when you figure it out, come back and talk to me. Oh, great. <laughs> Because that's what happens in life. We have everybody responds to different situations in life differently, right? And so sometimes we explode in an out-of-control flesh out. Ever flesh out before? Ever just stomp your feet and throw something at something and then, oh, it was the window that you threw it at and it broke and or mirror or how about if you go across the... The, uh, the living room floor, and you step on a Lego. Anybody stepped on a Lego before? Or step on a toy on the stairwell, and you go for a ride all the way down the stairwell. If you have short stairwells, it's not so bad, but if you have an eight-foot stairwell, it's pretty rough by the time you hit the bottom, right? Because life is, things happen, and for instance, if so I say, go ahead and hit me with your best shot, right? You're ready. You're, you're going to take that punch with everything you got, right? Okay. And, and then you're going to have your turn, right? Well, sometimes those punches come out of nowhere. You know, they, um, so they call them sucker punches. Oh, yeah. We were in high school. We had these two guys. They were always at each other. And one guy was waiting outside the gym locker door. Bell rang, the guy walked out, and the guy co-cocked him right in the side of the head. And, but he didn't hit him hard enough. And the guy hit the ground, he flipped his leg and kicked the guy onto the ground. He got on him, and he beat him senseless. See, because the guy knew that if he tried to hit him on a fair fight, he wouldn't win. Well, he still lost, even though he cheated, right? Well, life is like that. Sometimes the devil will give you a sucker punch. And that sucker punch can come from everything from bad phone calls. You know, ever got a bad phone call before where bad news, um, arguments, or um, maybe worries. Ever have a time when you're worrying about something you shouldn't worry about? And you know you shouldn't worry about it, but you're worrying about it anyway. Anxiousness. And some says, oh, I never worry. Well, probably would never admit it, but if you can't sleep because you're thinking about something, you're worrying. And worry comes in a lot of little forms. But um, hopefully you're not all worrying and you're not all going through bad times all the time, and hopefully life is a much more positive experience. But there are times when life is dealing us a rough hand. Oh, yeah. Ever play cards? We play un Dirty Uno all the time. And you love it when you get all the nice, dirty Uno cards that you can play against everybody, right? But then all of a sudden, somebody throws down a seven, and they take all your good cards, and they give you bad cards. You know, you're down to one card, and all of a sudden, they take your one, and now you've got 18 cards. Life is kind of like that at times. We can think we got things happen, but then things take off. And Satan is very good. Have, ever have Satan lie to you? Tell you things like, you're no good. You're not saved. You're a failure. You're going you're gonna to fall so short of this. You're never going to get your, the money you need to pay that bill that you need that bill paid. Um, they're not going to recover from their sickness. Now, there's all sorts of lies, right? <clears throat> and Satan, is, is, he's our enemy anyway. He's the one that comes against us. He's the one that <clears throat> uses circumstances to, uh, to bring us down. It says in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
You see, there's two different worlds out here. Right. <laughs> you have the easy world, right? You have uh, the nice music playing and all this, and you can see people and touch people. Then you have this underworld, it's a spiritual world, it's a demonic world. And it's real. And Satan is scheming and planning against your life. He's wanting to take you and defeat you and cause you to struggle in life. Because his ultimate goal is to get you to throw your hands up and say, I give up. <clears throat> well, we can't give up. I said, never give up. Right, say that. Never, never give up. Never. Never, never ever. Amen. Because that's what Satan wants. This is the time, thus the, the title of my sermon, to grab a hold of the altars of God. <clears throat> you know, it's being... I wrote significantly to actively get going for God, placing your sacrifice and tying it to the horns of the altar, taking your situation and actively standing firm on the altar of God and grabbing a hold of the arms, just like that bull I talked about, and saying, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to de be defeated. I'm not going to let this bring me down. I'm not going to tell, talk to my wife bad, or I'm not going to talk to my husband bad because it goes both ways, or to my kids. <coughs> Ever had a snotty kid, 17-year-old kid you had to talk to before? Huh, Esther? <laughs> right, sister? They think they know everything. And... I had my one of my kids, not the youngest one, the oldest one. She goes, she goes, Dad, I'm never going to be poor like you. Oh, <laughs> I said you're going to be rich and have everything you want, right? And well, guess what? She's figuring out that she has to grab a hold of the horn of the altar in life and go to work and pay her bills and have a budget and to live life because things are real. <clears throat> and yeah, I, I saw that. <laughs> anyway, in Psalms it says eight one eighteen twenty seven says, "God is the Lord, which has sold us light, and bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar." <clears throat> God tells us to grab a hold of life. Grab a hold of those situations, those circumstances, and put it on his altar and say, God, here it is. I'm not giving up, but here's my situation. What is your altar? Where is your altar? If your altar is only after each time the sermon is preached, then you're kind of missing it a little bit. Your altar is your relationship with God. Your altar is when you get beyond your knees wherever it is, and say, oh, God, help me. Oh, God, I need you involved in my life. Oh, Lord God, do whatever is necessary. Show me. Give me wisdom because it's not only here after the sermon, but it's when you wake up in the morning and the first thing you should do is say, you know what? God, I'm putting you in charge of my life today. Amen. When you decide to grab a hold of the horns. I looked at a picture. And the altar was pretty much a box, right? A box. Okay? But on that box, was on each corner was a horn. And the horn was made of brass. It's just like the scripture said. And it says, tie your sacrifice to the horns of the altar. Why do you suppose they want you to tie that thing up there? Just because it looks good and you know, how to tie, you know how to tie your sailor knots and your boy scout knots? No, they want you to... Make sure it doesn't come off of there, that you give it to God. But what we find out that happens is that <clears throat> everybody, ever been a starter and not a finisher? How many projects you got at home that you started but you haven't finished yet? 63 of them, huh? <laughs> Is that you? <laughs> because it's easy to start with vigor and with excitement. It's like starting a diet, I and mean, that's a great example of one. How many of you ever been on a diet and failed? Come on, honest hands. Diets are hard, aren't they? They are so hard, and why are they so hard? 
Because there's a lot of things that try to stop you from getting it. Emotions, the feeling of defeat. You ever get on the scale and that didn't go down this time? And you look at this scale, you know, there's two little girls that were standing in front of this bathroom scale. And the one girl looks at the other and goes, she says, don't you get on there. She goes, why? It says it makes mommy cry every time she gets on it. <laughs> because... There are things in life that they sound real good and they sound easy and we have great intentions, right? That we're going to do this. Ever set these um, New Year's resolutions? You know, that's just my to-do list for the first week. Because they're hard to keep a hold of a resolution. <clears throat> and so when we grab a hold of these, uh, the altar of God, we do it with purpose. Amen? We do it with purpose, okay? But once you do it, you've got to decide, I'm going to continue to do it. Because it's so easy to get distracted and busy. How many ever wake up in the morning and you can just barely open your eyes and where's the coffee pot and, uh, you know, and uh, where's, my, where's my clothes to go to work? And, and you get out and you get in a hurry and you're car won't start and you got to get the jumpers out and the charger or the tires flat or uh, you get halfway to work and realize I should have filled up last night and you're stressing because you got to get to the gas station before you run out and you and then also you realize that you haven't done some essential things in life like maybe acknowledge God maybe get a hold of the throne of God <clears throat> you see altars now, back in the Old Testament, they literally made altars, right? They built them and they put stones. And But <coughs> today we don't have, most people don't have a stone altar in their house in the middle of the living room. If you do, then more power to you, amen? But most of us, we have a, a form of an altar with possibly a, 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 a overstuffed chair that we get on our knees and we pray in the chair or we sit. Sometimes we used to come down to the church a lot, and that's kind of, I don't know how many people come down to the church and pray in the mornings, but we used to. And that was your altar in the morning. That's where you came. That's where you got a hold of God. That's where you, you kind of meditated, and that's where you kind of started your day, right? You started it. But nowadays we're so distracted and so busy that we don't... Um, have that altar anymore so what does the altar become it becomes sunday morning sunday night and thursday night <clears throat> here's your altar right this is where you meet with god and that's a good thing that you come up here on those days at least you get three a week right but really serving god is seven days a week amen amen, amen. and uh the altar you know that's a place that you can make a covenant with god God, I'm going to stick to my promise. I'm going to uh, read my Bible as much as I possibly can. Um, I'm going to um, be nice to my, my spouse. Ever have to pray that prayer? Sometimes it's easy, but <clears throat> there are days. My famous last words, dying words of an argument is whatever. Whatever. That creates a lot of problems. Yeah, don't don't use that one, yeah, okay? Okay? Because whatever is really saying, I don't care what you're saying. I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And it, it goes across real badly. And so sometimes you've got to make a decision on how you're going to behave in life. Because this old fleshly man, or, and I thought about that. I have an old man, and, whoops, and you, you ladies have an old lady, okay? It's just the old flesh, the old nature is there, and it's alive and well. And if you don't keep it under subjection, it's going to take control of your thoughts. And when it takes control of your thoughts, then whatever is in your heart will come out of your mouth, and then you're in trouble. <laughs> because whatever comes out of your mouth, usually you can't take back. I remember Vicki and I, we had a, a kid's study, and maybe some of your younger kids will remember but we took toothpaste, and we squeezed it onto a plate, the whole tube, and, and said, get it all out now, every bit of it. And these kids, 
They had every ounce of that toothpaste. And then she says, okay, now I want you to put it back in the tube. Oh, wow. You think you can get the toothpaste back in that sucker? It is not going to happen. She says, that's how your words are. When you, something comes out of your mouth, it's out there. And a lot of people says, well, you know, I didn't really mean to say that. No, no, no. Your flesh meant to say it because that's why you said it. Which means we need to check our hearts, right? Because <clears throat> sometimes it's easy to say, oh, I forgive everybody. And I, like my grandfather said, I never get angry. My grandfather, we're out fishing right out on Lake Odell. He's got an old 14-foot boat with an old 35-horse motor. And all of a sudden, we're going along, and all of a sudden, he just quit going. And so he realizes that the prop's not turning, the motor's running, but the prop's not turning. So this big old motor, he has to pull it and lift it up and crawl out on the end of it and take the propeller off. And there's a shear pin in there <coughs> that he has to put back in and put it all back together. Well, he's out there, and the things that he was saying that little grandchildren could probably never hear, right? But we... He was getting angry, right? He was getting upset and frustrated. And we get back that night, and we're sitting in the house, and um, and something was said about getting angry, and and he says, "Well, I never get angry." And my brother and we looked at each other, and we looked at him. Hmm. Well, it sure looked like anger to us, right? And sometimes there's struggles in life, and there's things that happen, and our response to those things in the reality we said well I'd never get upset about that but how about when somebody you're going down the road and somebody almost hits you and cuts you off <clears throat> you don't get frustrated with the poor guy and honk your horn and shake your fist at him maybe road rage starts to happen and you start speeding up and to tell him what you think and pretty soon you're more angry than he was <clears throat> and then there was one time this guy was yelling at this lady and he pulled into church, walked up the door, and here walked up this lady that he had been talking to me rudely, yelling at her. Oh, I didn't know you went to this church. He got caught because you never know who you're talking to. Now, I live in a mobile home park in uh, Mariner Village on 124th Street. And in that park is a couple that lives there. And that couple that lives there knows at least three people in this building right now that I know because they're grandparents, sort of. Their names are the Hobbs, and you guys probably know who they are, and they know who you are. And I had no idea that they know who you were, and they kept showing up on my news feed, and I'm going, why is she getting so nosy with the people I'm talking with? In my mind, I'm thinking, she's looking at my thing and making comments. But reality is, she knew those people better than I do. And so we never know. The world can be very small at times. It's just in here alone. Anchorage, Alaska. Man, it's been a long time, hasn't it, Amber? My, your pastor, my pastor. I followed up on your pastor as a new convert in April. So I know that's dating myself, right? But the reality is, is that you need to be careful what you're doing in life. And sometimes your emotions and your feelings and your thoughts, your inability to forgive. I mean, everybody knows I need to forgive, right? Amen? We all need to forgive. We don't need to harbor bitterness. Those are all bad things in life, right? We need to be loving and kind and... but. You know you haven't forgiven when the person that you haven't forgiven walks into the room and you can feel your gut tighten up and your brain start going, oh, they're here. Well, I'm gonna, just going to stay away from them. Well, if you can't get along with them, stay away from them. But you're supposed to forgive them and let the past go, right? Yeah. Let it go. Yeah. But you see, sometimes we only let it go as far as we can not reach it. But when it's convenient, the devil will bring that thing right back to your forefront and he'll come against you. And those are the things I'm talking about. When we grab a hold of the altar of God, <clears throat> those issues in life that, that 
you can do nothing about because I, I know people, they don't care one iota about us. They'll criticize you. <clears throat> they'll undermine you. Maybe it's a person at work. I had a boss that, because I was a Christian, he was finding any fault he could with me and writing me up. Every Friday I'd come to work and he'd have another piece of paper on my desk for me to sign. And it caused me great stress. But you've got to keep your testimony, right? <clears throat> you've got to keep the mouth shut. You got, can't say things because they're looking for you to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. There's a lady, her name was, uh, her name was Sally. I think it was Sally. I can't remember hardly anymore. But every time things got tense, she was waiting for me to say a cuss word. And she says, oh, you didn't cuss, did you? And if she thought I did, she'd say, oh, was that a cuss word? Because the world's watching us, right? The world's watching everything you do. And it's critical whatever you do is going to make a difference on whether you have credibility to talk to whoever it is you need to talk to. And if you're out there bad-mouthing people, especially at work, it's real easy to get into the coffee thing and start chewing on some other employee. But you got to watch it that you don't do that because it gets really easy to do that. In other words, you have to make solid choices, right? You come to the altar, you make choices and decisions, commitments to God, and then you've got to stand on that. And it says in Joshua 24, 15, it says, And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. You have to choose. You have to say, I'm going to grab a hold of the horn of this altar, and I'm going to serve God, no matter what, Amen. even if I don't like it. It's kind of one of those things like <clears throat> you go to somebody's house and they're serving liver and onions, and you hate liver and onions, <laughs> right? I mean, you, you, the smell of it makes you nauseous, right? But you got to be nice, right? So you choke down the liver and onions. It's not pleasant, but you keep a smile on your face, and you'll get through this time. Being nice to people, I remember Pastor Roberson used to say Crabtree. He, that's, he always talked to me that way. Crabtree, first he'd go like this. <laughs> Amber remembers. I, I'd walk up, and he says, Crabtree, you got to be nice to people. <laughs> yeah, but he says, no, Crabtree, you got to be nice to people. <laughs> well, they're not being nice. He said, I don't care. You've got to be nice. You've got to be gracious. You've got to be above them. You've got to rise above their pettiness. <clears throat> and that's part of grabbing and holding of the altar. That's saying, God, I'm going to be the light of Christ Amen. to the world of, of sinners. Amen. I'm going to stand above. I'm going to have character. <clears throat> I remember he used to tell me that I was going through a rough time. He says, Crabtree, he, always used <laughs> he says, God's just building character in you. Well, I don't like how God's building character in me at all. <laughs> but the reality is, is that God is building character in us. And we have to rise above the world and start being a Christian. Amen. And a Christian is somebody who is like Christ, Christ-like. And sometimes we have to choose to do that, you know, because <clears throat> it's not easy sometimes. So finally... It says in Ephesians 6, 12 to 13, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand uh, in the evil day, having to done all to stand, and then the next verse, stand therefore. It's saying, when you recognize that you're in a battle for, your, for the souls of men and for your own soul, it says, put on the armor. Right. Now, I, I'm not saying that you get up in the morning, <clears throat> okay, here's my plate of righteousness. Let's put that breastplate on. Oh, now I'm putting on my belt, and now I'm putting my shoes on. <clears throat> it's not really a, a physical thing that you get up in the morning and do. But when you're preparing as the, a Christian, a soldier of God, 
<clears throat> you're doing all these armor pieces of studying your Bible and praying and, and living. And there's this, it's a symbolization of what we should be doing 24-7. Not just get up in the morning and say, okay, God, I'm dressed for battle. <clears throat> you should be dressed for battle all the time. And uh, so this is part of my time, actively grabbing a hold of the altar. Actively, we get up and we say, we're serving God today. Amen. Whether you like it or not. Right. And you grab that old flesh of yours by the nap of the neck and says, come on, we're going to do this thing. <clears throat> it says in Romans uh, 8, uh, verse 1, if there is now there, there's, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. You see, salvation is, is the base of your altar, amen? Your salvation, what you, how you live for God, your relationship with God, all those things are part of your altar. Every day you're at your altar, right? And <clears throat> but, to, but you need to know who you are in Jesus Christ. Who are you in Jesus Christ? Are you a slug? I'll, you know, the, the, there's a little saying, I guess I'll go eat some worms, right? There's a whole saying to that, but I'm just going to say, we can have the attitude when we get up, it's, oh, poor me, I'm just Eeyore. Have me remember who Eeyore is. Oh, yeah. It'll never work. It's, you know, it will work. It does work. Serving God works. Is it easy? No. But is the best thing you could ever do for yourself Amen. is to live for Jesus. Amen? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so we have the altar of God. And then our scripture says, grab a hold of the horns of the altar, right? So I named the horns just because it works, okay? The first horn is prayer. Amen. The first thing you do is you grab a hold of a prayer life. So the question is, is, are you grabbing a hold of your prayer life? Remember the wrapped in brass, right? The strong, solid horn that if you landed on it, it would puncture something. Horn. But it's solid. When you grab it, <clears throat> it's not easily moved. It can't be torn off. It's solid. It's all part of that whole altar. So we pray, right? We get a hold of God and we, we have that spiritual relationship, that connection. You know, I hear the small, still voice of the Lord, right? Because if you're not praying, pretty soon what's talking louder than God's voice? Everything else. It's like the radio keeps getting turned up and up and up and pretty soon... It's like your car. I remember have a car that you just turn the radio up so you don't have to hear what's going on with it. <laughs> yeah. Right, Richard? Just turn the radio up. You'll never hear the brakes squealing. You ask your wife, she says, didn't you hear that? She says, oh, I didn't hear it. But half the rotor is missing because she didn't hear it. How could you not hear this? I don't know. I had the radio up, you know, because... We don't like to hear things when they are going on. So put the prayer on, grab a hold of the prayer all, the horn, and start letting that become louder than everything else. Amen. Amen. It says in James 5.16, it says, um, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And... <clears throat> prayer is a powerful, powerful tool. We talked about using a javelin as prayer is a javelin. It's a weapon to, to stop the enemy. When you're praying, you're stopping the enemy. You're saying, whoa, stop. You get into situations like maybe you're having a rough marriage, right? And when you come home, things get off on the wrong foot <clears throat> and it gets chaotic and you can't even talk to each other, right? The best thing you can do at that moment in time is says, go, go somewhere quickly, say, oh, God, help us. And then say, honey, let's pray. Even when you don't want to. Because believe me, when you're fighting with your loved spouse, the last thing you want to do is to agree on anything together. You need to stop, 
especially if you're the leader of your home, says we need to pray this isn't of God. <clears throat> and as you grab a hold of that prayer and pray, you'll feel that spirit of anger and that spirit of chaos. It'll stop. Now, it's still going to feel, but it, it'll, peace will start to come in, and you can start to think rationally, and you can say, hey, <clears throat> even if we don't agree, we can agree to disagree and still get along. Because there are issues that sometimes we don't agree with. But anyway, the first one is that grabbing a hold of the horn, the, the uh, uh, prayer as a horn. The second one, it says reading your Bible. How actively do you read your Bible? Honestly. Now, you know, I get these prayers things on my phone, a daily prayer. Now, that's nice, and it's good, and they're good prayers, and sometimes they fit certain circumstances, but that's not really what it means. It really, really means is take time. Take time to read. Uh, not just read either, because I can read all the little epistles in a couple hours, right? That doesn't mean I can they mean anything to me necessarily. Now, I am putting those in my heart. But when you pray, one of the things you pray is, God, help me to get something out of what I'm reading. Okay, <clears throat> it says, um, Psalms 119.11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, as you put the word in and you grab a hold of this other, now you got this horn and you got this horn, they work together to keep things stable. See, the thing's all meant to work together, right? And so, <clears throat> read your Bible, and there will be things that God will put in you that become automatic responses, it's Christian responses. Um, the Spirit of God will start to take control of the flesh. Because usually what's happening in most times when it's chaotic is that Satan is poking your flesh with chaos. You need to grab a hold of the Spirit. Because since there's a war that's going on between the flesh and the spirit, well, you want the spirit to win over the flesh. So you have to pray and read your Bible. Third horn is, says, being in church. You know what? It says that the power of uh, the Word of God is the preaching. When you preach the Word of God, there's power in it. And the reason that is is because <clears throat> I can be preaching on something, but it could hit three different people at three different ways for three different reasons. The Holy Ghost can just minister at will. <clears throat> and God can help us to be together in that. It says in um, the last one I want to say, um, let's see, well, let me read this. Hebrews 10.25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together <clears throat> as the manner of some is, but it, exhorting one another and so much more as ye see the day approaching. How many believe we're in the last days? Amen. How many think things are getting kind of chaotic out there? Oh, yeah. How many like going to the store right now, grocery stores? I think it's absolutely crazy to go to grocery stores now. I, you know, Amazon's starting to become my friend because I don't have to go deal with people. And people are just what they are, but the, the, we got a very self-consumed uh, spirit out there. It's a, all me, myself, and I. And it's like you're walking to go pick something up, and somebody just bumps your arm and they grab what you were going to grab, <clears throat> and they don't even say sorry. It's almost like, could you get out of my way? Because we live in a very cruel world, and it's getting worse because in the Bible says in the last days it's going to get worse. So, and let me see here. Last of all, very important. This is so important. Submission to your pastor. Amen. How many have a relationship with your pastor? I'm not saying, oh, hi, pastor. I, I'm talking a relationship where he knows you. Remember I said my pastor, Overson, he'd say Crabtree. Now, it was always never fun sometimes to hear Crabtree come here. Right? But he knew me. He knew my wife. He knew how things were going. He knew all about things that were going on. He could sit and he could say, what's wrong, Crabtree? You got an attitude? Ever had the pastor jack you up because you're not doing what you ought to be doing? 
Can your pastor do that to you? Can your pastor confront you with an issue and you not throw up a fit? Who does he think he is? What, what's it his business? Why is he bothering me? Who does he think he is? Um, let me think. He's God's, mes- he's God's ambassador. He's God's leader for you. God put him there to help you. Amen. And Amen. he's there to be your shepherd. You know where the shepherd is? That's the guy with the cane that kind of guides the sheep along the way and it shows them greener pastures and better ways of life. But if you have a relationship with your pastor, when you do have issues and when you do have problems and you're not sure how to deal with them, you can go up and say, Pastor, I'm not sure how to deal with this. And he says, well, let's, let's talk about it. And he can sit down and talk with you and he can counsel with you. But counseling with you means if he gives you advice, why don't you try doing it? Amen. I tried to give some advice to a couple. I said, you know, the best thing you two could do is to pray together every night. Just pray. Stop everything and pray. And it will help your marriage a bunch. <clears throat> well, guess what? They, they, they thought that was stupid. They thought it was silly. They even agreed with me. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good idea. But if it came down to doing it, they didn't want to do it. Because it meant that somebody had to admit they needed help. Pride, a bunch of things like that. But you, you need to do what that is. There's an old song, the Pink Floyd song. And it's, I think it's a brick in the wall song. And there's this mean old nasty teacher. Got this really rough, hoarse voice. <clears throat> he says, he says, you got to eat your meat. How can you have pudding unless you eat your meat? You remember the song? And how can you have a good life, a strong life, and deal with the issues if you won't grab a hold of the altar of God? You won't grab the horns. If you won't do simple, basic things, how can you have a blessed life? Because if you don't do those things, uh, the devil knows it. Did you know the devil knows when you're not doing the right things? And what's the first thing he does? He brings condemnation. He makes you feel guilty. He condemns you. And he stirs up muck in your home. He gets hold of your kids. And when your kids, you know, don't let your kids run the house. It's your house. It's not their house. They get to live in it, but it's your house. And if you don't want them to do something, they're not doing it. That's what you say, solid. <clears throat> if you don't want them listening to bad music, playing bad games, talking back, having attitudes, tell you what. Go to the grocery store. I was there yesterday, and I, I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. There's a kid, and he is wanting something that's on the other side of the aisle, and his mom's not going to give it to him. He said, I can't get it right now. I can't afford it. And he starts just to wail and scream. I mean, it was makes your backbone go soft. And I'm thinking, why are you letting him run you in the grocery store? I say, my mom, you know, there's one thing about her is you didn't do that. And my kids never, I, my kids, I never even had to say a thing to them at this grocery store. They just knew that that wasn't going to happen. And if you're firm and you stand your ground, it's your house. It's a house that's godly. Don't let your house become, let your kids make it ungodly. You know, because... If you, if you let them, they will run you. And believe me, they will. But I was never that way. I That wasn't going to happen. And I was steadfast. And this was part of living this life, of grabbing the altar. You have to say to yourself, this isn't going to happen. We're not going to have fights in our house. We're not going to be calling each other names. We're not going to use the D word. When we do have arguments, you know what the D word is? Divorce. Or it's over. Fine. Let's just forget it. 
can't have relationships like that. You can't use those type of verbiages because it's already over if you are. Because you're, you're claiming it right there. When you, you, words are powerful. And when you say it's over, that's what you mean. And you go, think you can go back to this. Well, I didn't really mean that. Well, how does, that other, how does your wife really know that? Or your husband really know that? Because <clears throat> what happens is when you start talking like that, then Satan finds a girlfriend for him at work or for her at work. And it starts out as this comment, oh, yeah, we're having a struggle in our marriage. Oh, yeah, me too. And pretty soon they start finding little things in common. But it's not God. But they start to find a friendship between each other. And what it does is that friendship, there's taken away from the relationship that's at home. <clears throat> so you have to say, you know what? Grab a hold of life. Grab a hold of the altar of God and say, these things aren't happening anymore. We're going to live for God. As far as me and my house, we're going to serve God. Amen. You have to claim that. You have to stand on that. And as, they, as you stand on that claim, in the long run, you're going to have a blessed life. Amen. I have a blessed life. I have married 40 years, three kids, 11 grandkids, house. I mean, God's blessed our, He's blessed our house because we stuck to it. Amen. Was it easy? Some of you know me. It hasn't been easy at all. But it's the best thing I got. It's just like when the, when the disciples all left, 70 left Jesus. He looked at the 12 and he says, are you leaving also? And what does Peter say? He says, no, you, you're the Christ. You have the words to life. Yeah. He just, Peter said, I'm not. He's, and that's what we need to do. We have this way of life. This is many ways of life you can live, but this is the best way to live. This is brings the best result. Not only eternity, but right here, right now, in this world, right now that we're living in, living for God is the best answer. So <clears throat> in closing, grab a hold of the altars, Amen. the horns of the altar of God. And as you do that, you're going to have control where if you don't do that, then the world's going to have control over you. And I'd rather have control. Amen. Amen. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed just for a moment. Nobody looking around. <clears throat> you see, back in 1985, I grabbed a hold of the altar of God. I was an alcoholic. My marriage was going down the tubes. And we had some friends that lived next to us, and they started talking to us about Jesus. And one night, we had a revival service. It was actually a movie, movie night. And the pastor, he pulls an altar call just like I'm calling right now. He says, you're here tonight because God designed it for you to be here. If you're hearing my voice right now, it's because God wants you to be here. And God wants you to make a decision tonight. He wants to make a choice. <clears throat> and that choice is to serve God. That choice is to ask Jesus into your heart and to let Jesus be the Lord and master of the rest of your life to where you can have a <clears throat> not only a blessed life, but an eternal life. <clears throat> and he said, if you're out there right now, God is knocking on your heart's door, just like I'm knocking on this pulpit. And there's no denying it. You know it's God. You know that he's drawing upon your heart right now. <clears throat> and he wants you to give your life to Jesus because he loves you. He cares about you. And he has a great, wonderful blessing for you in life. Um, maybe it's tonight whether you ever have or not, maybe tonight God's knocking on your heart's door and he's tr trying to draw you to his love. And he, I just say, do you, if you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Jesus or you have, but you've, it's never been solid in your life. It's been kind of up and down. I just simply ask that if God's knocking on your heart's door, that you just simply say, you know what? I need to answer God's knocking on my door and I need to respond and give my life to Jesus. If that's you tonight, 
I'm just going to simply ask with every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking around. Is that you? Is God talking to you right now? Is God the Spirit of God? You, your heart's starting to pound and thump. You, can, you know it's God. That you say, you know what? God's talking to me. I need to respond. And if that's you, I just simply ask, just raise your hand real quick. No one can see you. Okay, there God sees that hand right there. Um, any others tonight that God's drawing upon your heart? He wants you to give your life to Jesus. And you need to give your life to Christ because it's the best decision you'll ever make in your life. All right. Uh, did you mean that? You meant that? All right. Can you come up here, please? I want to actually come up and. Um, Doug, would you pray with him, please? Doug's going to lead you through a prayer. Any others tonight that you need Jesus? It's a good life. It's a blessed life. And if God's calling on you, you know what? It's hard. You can feel your the pride's rising up inside of you and he's saying, not yet, not yet. I'm not quite ready, but I'm telling you, God's calling upon you tonight. That's you. You know it. Whether you're young or old, it doesn't matter your age. If you understand what I'm talking about, God's calling upon you to give your life to Jesus. Okay, we're going to move forward. Tonight we talked about grabbing a hold of the altar the horns of the altar of God. Well, if we're all saved, we have the first part of the altar. But the question would be is, have you been grabbing a hold of the other altar, the horns of that altar? Because if you do that, God's going to help you. But if you haven't, now you can make a commitment. You come to the altar and say, God, I'm going to start doing that. So we're going to open up the altar tonight for you to come, make some commitments. Uh, whatever else, if there's something else that God's been dealing with you, let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to sing that song. For He is Lord. <coughs> Lord. He has risen. He has risen from the dead. Every knee, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, for He is Lord. For he is Lord, he is Lord, <clears throat> he has risen from the dead, and he's my Lord. Is he your Lord tonight? Every Give Jesus praise tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, kashando lo 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 bo sandai. Thank you, God, for moving tonight. God, we thank you for this time. Amen. So I'm excited to see what conference guys bring back for Sunday. Um, pray that God will help them come back safely. And um, God is good. Amen. Um, Andrew, would you close us in prayer, please?